Hey, my name's Matt Kennedy, and this is the Steadfast Podcast. This podcast exists to use Bible study and theological teaching to encourage you to be steadfast in your faith. Thank you for taking time out of your day to check out the Steadfast Podcast. I hope today's episode is an encouragement to you. Last week, we talked about Jesus taking his disciples to the Mount of Olives to pray. But remember, he didn't take all the disciples. There was one disciple, Judas, to whom Jesus said, what you are going to do, do quickly. We know that Judas was going to go get the temple guards, and he was going to bring them to come and get Jesus. But the rest of the disciples were in the dark. They had no idea what Judas was really up to. They thought that Judas was just going to go buy something that Jesus needed, or maybe make a donation to the poor. They did not know his true schemes, but oh, they are about to. Today, we're going to finish up Luke 22 and talk about how Jesus was betrayed. There's not many events that show up in all four Gospels. John's baptism, the feeding of the 5,000, the triumphal entry, the Last Supper, Jesus' trial and crucifixion, burial, resurrection, are all on the short list. As is this, his betrayal. I don't think it's a stretch to say some events just stuck out to early believers more than others. I mean, can you imagine what they were thinking when they're like, Judas? Judas lived, traveled, ministered with Jesus for like three years, and he threw all of that away for a little bit of silver? It would have been mind-boggling to them when they understood the treasure of who Jesus is and what little that Judas gained, which was really a loss, when he betrayed Jesus. It would have been unthinkable, as it should be for us today. Now, our first point in talking about betrayal is that betrayal can bring anger. Betrayal can bring anger. We're going to pick back up in Luke 22, verse 47. Quote, While he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? End quote. While Jesus was still calling his disciples to pray, while the disciples are still waking up from the little nappy nap, Judas arrives with a crowd of guards. He comes up to kiss Jesus on the cheek to mark who Jesus is, to mark the guy they want to arrest. Now remember, they're dark. They're seeing by lit torches and lanterns. In the dark, a group of men of similar sizes and ages and backgrounds would have looked the same to someone not familiar with them. They couldn't exactly go off of his Facebook or Instagram profile picture, right? But Judas was oh so familiar with Jesus. He knew where Jesus would be. He knew what Jesus would be doing. He had been there with Jesus so many times before. If they went to check the upper room for Jesus, this was probably their next stop. John's gospel account tells us that Judas knew this spot well. Judas was supposed to be one of Jesus' best friends, having traveled with Jesus for around three years now. And by the way, we say three years because the Gospels appear to record three different Passover celebrations. And the Passover was a once a year event, so three different Passovers marks roughly three years time. While that's not an exact science, it's what's generally accepted among Bible scholars. Judas could have done a hundred different things to identify which man was Jesus. But he chose a kiss on the cheek, a very familiar gesture you would only do if you knew them well. Culturally, it was a sign of really close friendship. So Jesus asked Judas, you're betraying me with a sign of friendship? There was a cold nature to this moment. It was a stab in the back if there is ever one. There is no wonder why when someone feels betrayed now, they say, Judas, he is the ultimate betrayer. Let's read verses 49 and 50. And when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. End quote. It may have taken a while for the disciples to put two and two together, but they eventually got there. Eventually, the math started mathing for these guys. They knew exactly what was happening here. They understood betrayal when they saw it. Suddenly, they were no longer in the dark about who Judas is and what Judas was doing. They knew exactly who he was. And I can only imagine them having a sudden rush of memories. All the comments Jesus made along the way, one of you is a devil, one of you will betray me, etc. In this moment, the dots, all those dots connected. It is Judas the betrayer. They are angry. They're ready to fight. They're ready to attack with swords. How dare Judas do something so evil, so depraved, and to Jesus of all people. 
Now, Luke doesn't tell us which disciple chopped off someone's ear. For whatever reason, Matthew and Mark don't give us a name either. Maybe they're thinking, oh, this was not their best moment. This doesn't reveal their true character. All of us wanted to do this in their heart, so we can't point the finger at any particular guy. While three of the gospel writers chose anonymity of the ear-chopping sword-wielding disciple, John takes a different route. He chooses the route of the tattletale. He tells us it was Peter that went choppy-chop on the dude's ear. Cut it right off. Now, this should not be too surprising. John is also the disciple that lets us know that he outran Peter to the tomb. So, if Peter ever got the chance to read John's account, I bet they had a really funny conversation afterwards. He'd be like, come on, man, did you have to throw me under the bus every single turn of the story? Of course he did. Anyways, so while everyone was likely some mixture of angry and afraid, Peter is the one who drew his sword and struck the man. The other Simon, the zealot, had spent some of his life training to be an assassin of sorts, yet he managed to keep his cool. It was Peter whose anger controlled him in this moment. Now, anger is a natural response to betrayal. I didn't say it was the right response, but it is a natural response. It is something that comes out of us quickly. Usually what comes naturally isn't right, though. Look at how Jesus responds to Peter's actions. Verse 51, quote, But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. End quote. See, the natural response was not the right response in this situation. Jesus was not pleased with this outburst of anger. Lashing out with anger, trying to get even, is not the way Jesus taught his disciples to walk in. Remember last week, Jesus was fully surrendered to the will of the Father. It did not matter what he would have to endure. He would do it to be obedient to his Father. That mattered more to him. Obedience to the Father, pleasing the Father, mattered more than comforts or getting his own way. That means Jesus had a bigger objective than to get even with the guys doing him wrong. He could have easily called down angels from heaven to say, smite all of these guys, if that's what he wanted to. But his mission was not to get even. Instead of getting even on the guy doing him wrong, the guy arresting him to bring him to trial that would eventually lead to his crucifixion, he heals the servant of the priest. Now it's one thing to say, I forgive so-and-so for what they did. It is another thing entirely to do good to those who do you harm. I know you've had people do you wrong. Their actions, their words, they hurt you. And sometimes when we're hurt, we get angry. We want to get even. We want to even the score. I don't know what they did to you, but maybe you thought they were your friend. You thought you could count on them. Maybe you thought you could trust them with something and come to find out they used your friendship. They used your trust to turn around and do you harm, maybe for their own gain. Maybe a significant other cheated on you. Betrayal can look so many different ways. I am certainly not trying to diminish any of the ways that you've been betrayed, any of the ways that you've been hurt. Hurt and harm are real things. Yet Jesus calls us to do something that we can only do through him, and that is to love our enemies, to do good to those who do us harm. It is so important for us to understand. He has not called us to do something that he was unwilling to do himself. He was the model of forgiveness. I mean, when you think about this guy showing up to arrest him, to take him to a really a fake trial, to be tortured, to be executed, and Jesus does him good. He offered grace, and he chose to do good to someone who was there to do him harm. Let's pick back up in verse 52. Quote, Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders, who had come out against him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. We see here that these guys are coming out armed to the teeth at night. Jesus points out they had every opportunity during the day in public to arrest Jesus. But you might remember they were afraid of the people. The perception and the respect and the admiration of the people meant everything to them. They wanted to be important or at least feel important. Now here is an important life tip for you. If you have to do something at night when no one else can see what you're doing, if you have to do something behind a closed door to keep it secret, That might just be a sign that deep down, you know what you're doing is wrong. If you can't do it in the light, you probably shouldn't do it in the dark. If you can't do it in public, you probably shouldn't do it in private. Let's be a people of integrity. These people are being guided by Satan himself. And that's what the, in the power of darkness line means. Remember, it was Satan who entered into Judas, and it is Satan who has inspired such hate in all of these religious leaders to send their guards to arrest Jesus. Satan is at work here. Unfortunately, this is not the only betrayal of Luke 22. 
Now I want us to look at the other betrayal. We've seen that betrayal can bring anger, but it can do other things as we will see with our second point, which is betrayal can bring disappointment. Betrayal can bring disappointment. Let's pick back up in verse 54. Quote, Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. End quote. The guards lead Jesus away. Peter is following them from a distance, and at first glance, this is going to look like courage. But man, as we all know, courage can dissipate quickly. And we see Peter denying Jesus. The verses I just read record the first time Peter denied even knowing Jesus, and it was to a servant girl. Peter has gone from chopping off a man's ear in defense of Jesus to denying that he even knows him. Just like that, the pendulum has swung so fast and so far. You can picture this scene, a bunch of people around a fire at night as the flames flicker, shining their light. A servant girl, who should have been about the least intimidating person imaginable to Peter, she leans in. She studies Peter's face for a minute and is sure she has seen him with Jesus. Now Peter denies it. He's like, I don't know that guy. And that was that, because his word would have carried so much more weight than that of a servant girl. How fearful Peter must have been to shut her down like this. On the other hand, this was an easy one to get away with. No one would have given it a second thought. But the night wasn't over. Verse 58, quote, And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. End quote. Now Peter has denied knowing Jesus to an adult man. We don't know anything about this man who suggests Peter is with Jesus, but we do know this makes two times he is denied even knowing Jesus. It's also two opportunities Peter had to identify himself with Jesus, to have his friends back, but instead of having his friends back, being the good buddy, being the good pal, he shrank back. Picking back up in verse 59, quote, And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. End quote. Peter is waiting around for an hour. Nothing seems to be happening. He's probably thinking, Good, people are going to stop asking me this question. And then... A third person comes up and says, hey, you've got to be with this Jesus guy. But Peter denies it. Now, this person noted that Peter was from Galilee. Now, I'm guessing Peter's accent betrayed him a little bit. Something about him suggested Galilee. For the man insisting Peter knew Jesus, he's probably just thinking, what are the odds that two Galileans are here? Now, for some of us, our voices, our accents betray where we're from. We would never be able to deny what part of the world that we come from. It doesn't matter where I go. People are going to recognize that I am from the southeast of America. I'm from North Carolina. That's just the way my voice is. And apparently, Galilean accents were just as distinct in that region as a southern accent is, well, anywhere. What's most significant is that now we have seen three times. Peter could have had his friends back, and yet three times he didn't. Three times he could have risen to the occasion, but three times he shrank back. Three strikes, he is out. Peter is also oddly consistent on naming the gender of the person addressing him. Starting a sentence with, woman, man, man, it almost sounded as though there is an attitude behind the denial. It's not just a polite, no, you're mistaken. It has an edge to it. An unpleasant mixture of guilt, maybe fear swirling inside of him. Peter is not happy about any of this. Peter has denied knowing his Jesus three times in a very short period of time. He told Jesus to his face, eye to eye, that he was willing to lay down his life for Jesus. And when he was swinging his sword, it looked like he might just keep that word. But all of a sudden, where is his courage gone? On the night that someone would need a friend more than any other time, his friend disappointed. He came up short. Let's read verses 61 and 62. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. 
And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. End quote. I can't imagine how difficult that moment must have been for them both. Jesus knew what would happen, but still, Peter was one of his best friends, and Peter denied even knowing him three times. The sting of this betrayal must have been so bitter. Sometimes betrayal isn't some premeditated thing. Sometimes betrayal looks like being let down by friends or family, someone you thought you could count on. Maybe you just really needed them to come through for you and they didn't come through. It's not that they used you. It's not that they plotted against you. It's just they didn't have your back when you thought they would. Of course, Jesus knew of Peter's betrayal in advance, but we rarely will know of betrayal in advance. Sometimes it looks like an unmet expectation. We know Jesus is going to give grace to Peter, and he's going to restore Peter, and Peter is going to be forever marked by meeting Jesus. Peter is one of the most awesome guys to ever walk this earth. He will preach to thousands of people. He will share the gospel with who knows how many. He's going to heal the sick. He's going to cast out demons and was a rock for the early church. His importance is so tough to overstate. Thirty-something years after this passage, Peter would die by crucifixion because of how faithful he was to Jesus, because Jesus was the most important thing in his life. You know, some traditions even say that he was crucified upside down at his request because he did not believe he was worthy to die in the same manner of his Lord. But Peter was also human, and humans disappoint. Even though he is one of the most significant figures in all of human history, he was just a man. He was flesh and blood. He had faults. He had weaknesses. He was a human being in need of grace. I promise you, every single person who betrays you is just a human being in need of grace like Peter, someone who struggles with their own faults, fears, insecurities, and weaknesses, someone who needs to be forgiven. With our sin, we have all betrayed Jesus in one way or another, and yet He paid for that betrayal with His own blood on the cross. For those who believe, every sin has been paid for on the cross. Because we have been shown such extraordinary grace, let us also be dealers of hope and grace when other people let us down. Let those who have received grace show grace. Look, I don't know how you have been betrayed. I don't know how you will be betrayed. If it's something that's premeditated, if it's something that someone has plotted behind your back to do something just terrible, or if it's a situation where someone just didn't meet your expectation, where you thought they were your friend, you thought they had your back, and they just didn't. They came up short. Maybe it's a Judas situation. Maybe it's a Peter situation. But in either case, we are called to give forgiveness. We are called to pour out grace like it has been poured onto us. We who have been forgiven of more than we could ever calculate are called to be great forgivers. I'm not saying that it's easy. I'm not saying that it's natural. In fact, I'm going to say that it is something that is so difficult that without Jesus, without the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, you're not going to be able to do this. It is by God's power, God's strength in your life, God moving to mold you to become more and more like Jesus, that is the only way any of this is possible. So what I'm asking you to do is if you have some area of unforgiveness in your life, maybe there's betrayal that's more like Judas, maybe there's betrayal that's more like Peter, whatever it is, is to offer forgiveness today. Look, forgiveness is a marker that you understand that you have been forgiven. In the Lord's Prayer, we're even said that we need to forgive others of their debts against us because if we don't, then our Father who is in heaven won't forgive us of our sins. Do we see how big of a deal this is to forgive? So let's forgive freely, like Jesus did. Even though betrayal can bring anger and betrayal can bring disappointment, our Jesus brings grace, our Jesus brings hope, and our Jesus is going to be all that we need. Thanks for listening to the Steadfast Podcast. I want to remind you that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Paul wrote this, quote, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing 
that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. End quote. So in light of biblical truth, let us be steadfast, immovable. Let us remember that through Jesus, not one labor is in vain, not one trial is in vain, not one effort in all of our lives is in vain. Because he gives purpose, and that purpose rings through eternity. That's all I've got for you today. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget, if you've got questions you would like answered, you can email me at matt at steadfastpodcast.com.